When I was 22, after moving to a new city for graduate school, I saw a new psychiatrist for the first time as the part of the getting to know you part of the conversation. He said, are you dating anyone? And I said, nope. And he said, do you wish you were dating someone? And I said, that is a complicated question. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, well, I only like women, but I think God doesn't want me to have sexual relationships with women. And I could see the gears turning. <laughs> and he's like, so you're trying to figure out if you're gay or not? And I'm like, oh no, I'm totally gay. No doubt about that. I'm just not going to act on it because I love Jesus. And the, the whole rest of the session was just him with his secular mind trying and failing to wrap his mind around this. <laughs> our lives, our choices, and faith are absurd. Uh, what I hope to do tonight is to connect that absurdity to the gospel and Jesus uh, by way of some concepts brought to us by Martin Luther. Uh, early in his career, uh, Luther wrote a set of theses and proofs known as the Heidelberg Disputation, uh, contending, contending against one of the dominant strands of medieval soteriology. Uh, I'm not concerned with the argument per se, so every non-Protestant can rejoice, but, um, uh, but, but rather with a concept he introduces uh, as he's making his point, which I think is accessible to all of us. Uh, a distinct, uh, distinction between what he calls theologians of glory and theologians of the cross. The idea takes its inspiration from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness and the stumbling block here represent two facets of the theology of glory, which rejects the theology of the cross. The cross is foolish because the idea of human beings uh, being fallen and bondage to sin, needing extreme measures to be rescued from the power of the devil and reconciled to God, is a foolishness which contradicts worldly wisdom, which says it's not really that bad. Um, and it's a stumbling block because it, it claims that the Messiah, not only the Messiah, but the Lord of all, the creator of heaven and earth, did not come in a triumph of glorious, blatant power, but in weakness. People like a sense of wisdom and power in their religion, but God confounds them with the cross. God works in ways that bewilder us. It's not how we would do it. He works in ways that we consider in our natural selves to be ugly and disgraceful. The theology of glory, which is our natural religious impulse, is toward what is appealing, uh, aesthetically reasonable, towards what resonates with worldly wisdom, with what makes sense to us, with how we would do things, with how we think God should work, with what we think religion should be like. The theology of the cross, in contrast, points us to the cross. The cross is ridiculous and ugly. The cross is a sign of suffering and unbelievable shame. The cross is also a reminder of how very desperately helpless we were, what it took to set us free, and our continuing dependence on God. The cross tells us the truth that we don't want to know, the truth that contradicts all the lies we love to tell ourselves. And insofar as we are all called to be followers of Christ and imitators of Christ, the ugly cross barges into our own lives and stories also. 
for one of many examples, Romans uh, chapter six, verse six, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. There's all this talk about death, dying to self, putting sin to death. God works through weakness, trial, suffering, and a kind of death, not only in the death of Jesus, but also in the lives of his people. So what does this have to do with us? I think, in a way, we are confronted with two churches of glory. That is, two churches being influenced by the a theology of glory, one to our left and one to our right. The church of glory to our left looks at our sexual ethic and says, this can't be what God wants. A little bit like the cross, which is foolishness to the Greeks. Church of Glory to our right looks at our lives, in particular how gay we still are, <laughs> and says, this can't be how God works, a little bit like the cross, which is a stumbling block to the Jews. Both look at us and are confounded and offended. Now, let me make two clarifications before we really get rolling. I am not claiming that everyone in the affirming church or the conservative church that criticizes us are guilty of all the things I'm going to call out below. These are, but these are attitudes I see displayed, not infrequently, uh, in how these parts of the church act toward us. Uh, secondly, uh, the theology of the cross and the theology of glory uh, do not neatly divide the true Christians from the fake ones. Uh, kind of like Solzhenitsyn's line between good and evil that runs through the heart of every man, Carl Truman tells us that for Luther, the human soul is a battlefield where the theologian of glory struggles constantly to overcome the theologian of the cross. Uh, these are dueling tendencies in all of us. Uh, so I'd like to sketch for you four ways in which I see us uh, as theologians of the cross caught between these two churches of glory. First is inability to face truth. Uh, both churches of glory, I think, are unable to face the moral and experiential truths of our lives. Oh, Luther's uh, 21st thesis in the disputation is, a theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls a thing what it is. It's easy to see how the church of glory on our left does the former. Uh, they're doing and thinking and teaching what makes sense, what is resonant, um, what seems pleasant and good to the human wisdom of this age. Uh, in so doing, they flip the moral valences. It's not just that they're sure that homosexual sex or same, it's not just that they aren't sure that homosexual sex or same-sex marriage is wrong, is that they are sure that those things are good and right and, the doubting of their good, and it's the doubting of their goodness that's evil. Years ago, I had a correspondence with an affirming Christian leader and I was struck by the fact that for every scriptural passage dealing with marriage or sexuality, he had an explanation of why it's not really saying what it seems to be saying. But what I realized as we spoke is that there was nothing that the Bible could have said differently that would have changed his mind. The interpretive strategy he was using would have been able to deal with and do away with anything Paul or Jesus or Moses plausibly might have said. For Luther and for the Christian point of view more generally, I think, being impervious to how God has chosen to reveal himself is a problem. The whole point of Christianity, in a sense, is that we couldn't figure it out on our own, that God had to teach us, that God had to come down here to show us. One of the realizations that settled me in a traditional sexual ethic after months of confusion, maybe years, um, was that as personally counterintuitive as that sexual ethic was to me, there's something that's more counterintuitive, this crazy idea that God became man and suffered and died to free us from sin and reconcile us to himself that we might enjoy fellowship with him for eternity. When Luther talks about uh, the ability or inability to call a thing what it is, that makes me think of the church on our right. How much of the anxiety about language is about the desire to obfusc obfuscate, to refuse to speak plainly? Uh, if I only ever say, I experience same-sex attraction, that leaves it open how big or little an issue it might be. 
You can imagine me as one of those mostly healed people who has a stray homosexual thought on occasion, since, since after all, none of us will be totally sanctified this side of heaven. But if I tell you I'm gay, all of that wishful thinking is shattered, and horror of horrors, you see me as I am. Uh, I was there for the ex-gay movement, sort of later phases of it anyway. I was there for the rest, relentless attempt to minimize and obscure the reality of our experience and what our sanctification looked like in order to make the church comfortable. As a heterosexually married woman, uh, I've been shocked and heartbroken over and over again at how straight Christians who, who know about my past assume that I have been healed. Part of why I went back to the word gay is to resist that. Sometimes it seems like if I don't rub their nose in the fact that I'm still <laughs> predominantly same-sex attracted, they're just gonna keep trying to cover it up with pretty language and sentimental Christian cliches. And ultimately, that will end up hurting every gay person they come in contact with. The second aspect um, in which I see us as standing between two churches of glory is that um, both churches in their own ways cannot stand our ongoing weakness, brokenness, suffering, and struggle. Uh, Luther says in the disputation that the works of man always seem attractive and good while the works of God are always unattractive and appear evil. God's soteriological aesthetic is not our natural one. As this is true for Christ and the church, it is true in our own specific case. Uh, to normal human eyes, we are not a manifestation of healthy-minded religion, uh, religion which would be a useful assistant in helping a person fulfill his own goals and be his best self as he understands it. Uh, we freely admit weakness, fallenness, brokenness. Worse, we point out that God does not seem to be in a terrible hurry to sweep all this weakness and fallenness and brokenness away but seems content to invite us to work out our salvation in the ongoing presence of this very weakness. We are not persuaded that God wants to release us now from this, either by freeing us from the standard which judges our sexuality as fallen or by transforming it into what is normal. And both churches of glory see this as unacceptable. The affirming church gets rid of our brokenness and fallenness by defining it away. And it gets rid of our weakness and struggle by telling us that they're pointless and self-destructive, not spiritual, not Christian at all. As St. Louis area affirming religious leaders wrote in an open letter uh, regarding the Revoice Conference last year, uh, before the conference, we the undersigned condemn this conference as spiritual violence, unhealthy and unwelcome in our city. LGBTQIA plus people should be uplifted and celebrated for who they are, created exactly as they were meant to be. We are not problems needed to be fixed. We are unique and special, shining examples of the beauty of humanity, and we will not allow that to be taken away from us. Now, there's, there's totally ways in which they're misunderstanding us, I think, or misrepresenting us. <laughs> But I think at the heart of it, they still really have a disagreement with us, right? That they think um, they think our weakness is absurd, right? This this can't be right. This can't be the way. Uh, this can't be what God wants. This can't be the way it's supposed to be. Uh, in the eyes of the Church of Glory, to our left, weakness and struggle have become bad fruit. When Jesus brought up the tree and its fruits in the Sermon on the Mount to emphasize the importance of obedience and repentance, for them, Jesus' words have simply become an endorsement of whatever works. Uh, over against this consequentialism, the theology of the cross points to the mystery of weakness and suffering as redemptive, as Christ's way, as God's way, as the way of the disciple. There's a stress in Christian self-denial there's a burden in self-denial. God absolutely sanctifies those and brings good out of them, but that doesn't negate the initial death, the initial sacrifice. He who loses his life will find it, but you can't shortcut that. You can't tell God, hey, since you're gonna be giving me my life back anyway, how about I just hang on to it and we'll call it even? <laughs> And just as the Church of Glory to our left can't accept God's working through this ongoing weakness, 
the Church of Glory to our right can't accept it either. They say, okay, we're really uncomfortable with you being weak in this way, so it would be really great if you could take care of that ASAP, or at least hide it if you can't. And I want to look at this hiding and silencing. Much of the identity concern, I think, is ultimately comes down to wanting us to shut up about it. The, the bizarre fixation in some quarters, both Catholic and Reformed, on only talking about the ontological, uh, about our ultimate redeemed reality, seems to me designed to just make it more difficult for us to talk about the phenomenological, our experiences. Uh, I think there's no good reason why I should not be able to talk about how my fallen experience impinges on myself and my life. For Luther, we're simultaneously justified and sinners. Uh, it's destructive to forget or deny that. Uh, part of the theology of the cross is that I remember what's inside me and what I'm up against. One of the big things I notice when I compare the writings of approved voices in conservative circles with those in the dubious revoice or spiritual friendship crowd <laughs> is that there is a huge difference in the levels of humble, honest, open, vulnerable willingness to talk about the reality of their present experience. <laughs> Rosaria, Rosaria Butterfield in... in, in <laughs> In, two in, in her two books on the subject, can't seem to get around to talking about what her life of attraction and desire is like today. Uh, Christopher Ewan, in his recent book, Holy Sexuality, I think leaves it entirely unspecified whether he's still experiencing same-sex attraction or not. Um, but Wes Hill can talk about what it's like to struggle with this uh, in this beautiful way that's brought life to so many of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Greg, Greg Coles can talk about what it's like. Eve Tushnet can talk about what it's like. Part of the power and appeal of Revoice is this willingness to be real and talk about it. I'm surprised at the people, especially the married people, who have reached out to me. To oh, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know anyone else felt this way. The illusion that we're all pretty straight now, that we're making great progress down the path to gloriously transformed heterosexuality may be comfortable and delightful for the broader church, but it's so discouraging to us. It makes us despise and doubt God's love for us and his work in our lives. I noticed it was common in the Revoice criticism last year uh, for the criticizing pastors to say something of, along the lines of, now, don't think I don't love those with same-sex attraction. In fact, I've counseled and supported lots of folks struggling with same-sex attraction in my church. I think that's the pastor's version of some of my best friends are gay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, okay, where, where are these? Lots of folks, especially, especially if your approach is so redemptive and life-giving and so much better than ours. Where are they? Why aren't they in this conversation? You know, I mean, I'm not even being facetious there. If, I would love to have more people in this conversation. And I don't know everything. I would love to hear things. So, yeah, bring them in. But... <laughs> But part of the appeal of Revoice is one same-sex attracted person saying to another, hey, I'm trying to follow Jesus with this too. Here are some things that are tough for me. Here are some things that have helped me. Here are some things that I've learned. I think a lot of us are just kind of tired of random heterosexual opinions. <laughs> more, more on that in a moment. The third, <laughs> the third uh, way in which I see us as stuck between these two churches of glory is that both make false glory-oriented glory -oriented assumptions about how God works. That God would leave people 
with same-sex attraction despite their repentance and yet demand chastity of them, either in singleness or heterosexual marriage, is scary to the churches of glory on the left and on the right. I think people are drawn to these assumptions by anxiety about how they want to believe God will work in their lives. You know, when I read Job and I look at Job's friends, I think part of what animates their attempt to diagnose and solve Job's problem, why they insist his sin must be at the root of it, is that they can't handle the thought that God might treat them this way. And so they need to come up with some story to explain why they're gonna be safe, right? Uh, there's an anecdote about Teresa of uh, Avila, of Eli, I don't know, um, who, <laughs> who fell while crossing a stream and complained to God about it. And God supposedly tells her in the anecdote, do not complain, daughter, for that is how I treat all my friends. <laughs> and, Teresa, and Teresa replies, Lord, maybe that is why you have so few of them. <laughs> few are comfortable with the idea that this is how God treats his friends, right? Maybe we accept that that's how he might treat the special heroic saints and martyrs and apostles, but those are atypical cases. And I'm just an ordinary Christian. God won't push me too hard. God has a wonderful plan for my life and wants to expand my borders and prosper me and help me ace all my tests and help me succeed in my job and protect me and heal me and my loved ones and help me make my airport connections. <laughs> But our lives as gay people following Jesus and remaining faithful to a traditional sexual ethic rebuke everyone's assumptions and their rationalizations along these lines. The straight couple's questionable divorce, the upper, the upper middle class family's conviction that God's number one priority for them is their safety, security, and comfort. <laughs> the 20-somethings discernment that the right occupation for them, the one God is leading them to, must be the one which makes the most money, and the offended person's refusal to reconcile with another even in the presence of genuine repentance. Um, in all these cases, human beings struggle to accept what God might want of them. So the Church of Glory on the left, the church of this can't be what God wants, simply rejects this, right? Our path is toxic, according to them. This theology is abusive. This viewpoint is inherently bigoted. This is not compatible with a good, wise, loving God. This cannot be what God desires for his children, what he would call his children to, how he would work in their lives. Uh, many of the testimonies on that side point to dysfunction or unhappiness, right, as a reason for rejecting this theology, this calling. This is sometimes hard, this is sometimes painful, this is sometimes lonely, too hard, too painful, too lonely. God can't want that. The Church of Glory to our right approaches this from the other direction with a certainty about what God would do for us if we were really trying and repentant. I often talk about how in all the hundreds of gay people I've known personally, of those who've been predominantly same-sex attracted since puberty, I myself have not seen any credible cases of significant attraction change. Uh, not that I would say it's impossible. Um, and yet, virtually every straight conservative Christian I meet, even though they haven't studied these issues, and often don't even know any other same-sex attracted people, they're always a fountain of ideas about how we could get healed and become straight. Pray for this, pray for that, get therapy, get biblical counseling, have closer friendships with women, flee women and avoid them like the plague. <laughs> have closer friendships with men. Isn't there a pill you could take for this? <laughs> seek charismatic healing, seek deliverance. Get married, have more sex with your husband. Read this book, contact this ministry, talk to my pastor, talk to this friend of mine, use this language. No, use this language instead. They are, so, they are so sure that changing orientation from gay to straight has to be possible. 
I've seen many in Christians insist upon 1 Corinthians 6.11 as a proof text. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. But that doesn't work. Who is included in the you of and such were some of you? If it's only those who have experienced orientation change, my brothers and sisters, we're not washed, we're not sanctified, we're dead in our sins and we're of all people most to be pitied. Now, I think most of those who insist that orientation change is possible don't really want to condemn those of us who have not experienced that yet to hell, though I'm sure there are a few. But if we are included among the washed and waiting, and I'm confident that we are, there is no reason whatsoever to think that that verse has anything to do with attraction change or orientation change. Uh, <laughs> Likewise, Al Mohler has appealed to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17 as a proof text for attraction change. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Again, the logic can't work this way. If new creation implies attraction change, then we have not received that, have no part in the new creation. The new has not come for us. Now, please don't misunderstand me. We do not deny the transforming work of the Spirit. Uh, with, and, and different work, Luther, with Luther, from one of his different works, we joyfully and hopefully proclaim this life is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. Not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we will be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not gleam with glory but all is being purified. But let's talk about what this healing becoming really looks like. It looks like increased steadfastness, quickness and obedience, love for Jesus, humbling oneself before God's wisdom. It looks like a strengthened commitment to consistently choose true and pure love when it comes to our dealings with our neighbors and our brothers and sisters in Christ. It looks like increased spiritual mindedness and heavenly mindedness so that our light and momentary affliction seems more and more trivial in comparison to the weight of glory that awaits us. God displayed his power in the rescue of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the furnace. But I think he also would have equally displayed his power in assisting them to maintain their resolute obedience even if he had not rescued them. Is it possible that sustaining and purifying his gay saints while leaving the direction of their attractions mostly unchanged is one of his ways of bringing glory to himself? The final way in which I see us caught between these two churches of glory is for both of them, their theology of glory denies us the help of the church. The church of glory to our left claims that we don't need the church to discern the voice of God in our lives at all. Uh, we're just fine listening to the voice within. The church should just let the Holy Spirit do his work in individuals' lives. The teaching of truth is his job. Uh, a truly welcoming church for gay people would be one that simply gets out of their way as they discern how God is leading them and how they ought to live in love and just act as a cheerleader on the sidelines. But I think all of this contradicts the Bible's teaching that sometimes we need each other to speak truth into each other's lives sometimes to confront, sometimes to get into each other's faces, to call us to our senses. Rationalization is a thing. Self-deception is a thing. Confusion is a thing. The Holy Spirit has not been enough for me on his own, but I don't think God intended him to work that way, but also in the company of the fellowship of believers and the authority of the church. The church of glory to our left thus leaves gay believers to themselves depriving them the help of the church. Now, as I hope is apparent from lots of things I've said here and elsewhere, I, reckon that, I recognize that the church can and often does screw this up. There are times when they are ignorant. There are times when their own sins and hypocrisy and pride and bigotry are blinding them. So what I'm absolutely not saying is ignore the witness of your conscience and your understanding of the will of God as discerned through scripture and prayer and blindly trust whatever they tell you. But I think I'd wanna say that I think following Jesus and your conscience is compatible with being open to listening and learning from others, recognizing that we have our own blind spots and intellectual and moral weaknesses. I'm so grateful 
for faithful, loving Christian friends who after taking the time to listen well and get to know me, have been able to speak to me in ways that I believe were used by God, that God used them to bring his word to me. I don't think we have it all figured out here. I think we have much to teach the church, but I also think the church might have some things to teach me. I think a lot of the criticism last year was overly harsh, unjust, opportunistic, and in bad faith. But I also think that not everything they said is false and not every concern that they had is invalid. The Church of Glory to our right, I would argue, denies us the help of the church by a different route. The church's discomfort with the reality of this struggle, her desire to cover over it with wishful thinking, leads to her attempt to persuade us into silence. There's an emphasis on not talking about it. The cultivation of environments where we can't talk about it, which isolates us and leaves us to our own devices and too often at Satan's mercy. If we're willing to talk about it, that means we're not appropriately ashamed. Maybe if I lived with these temptations in a different era, maybe I wouldn't need to talk about it. But in this cultural moment now, I need to be able to talk about it. I know, church people, that you're sick of hearing about this from the world, but if you are feeling pressure from our culture, can you imagine what we're feeling? This, this perfect storm of world, flesh, and devil that we're up against right now. How relentless the temptation is, all the voices that say, you're hurting yourself by denying yourself. Why would you pay attention to some ancient book anyway? You're gonna trust those people and their interpretation over the cry of your own body? What kind of a self, pathetic, self-loathing twit are you? Church, I'm sorry this makes you uncomfortable, but I need you to know. I need you to pray. I need you to encourage me and tell me I'm not a complete idiot for trusting Jesus sometimes. I might need you to cry too. I might need you to hold me accountable. I might need you to rejoice with me in how God is actually sanctifying me. The souls of most same-sex attracted people are under relentless assault in this cultural moment. So if these are the theologies of glory we're caught between, how could our understanding ourselves in the light of theology of the cross strengthen and comfort us in our despised, confounding absurdity? What could God be doing in our weakness and struggle? What is good about this? Why would God leave us like this? Um, first thought is the witness of our surrender. In our absurd lives, we surrender our identities and our sense of what is good for us to God. It is plain to all that we are not lords of ourselves. We don't tell God who we are, what's essential to us, what our end is. God names us, God calls us. We recognize that on our own we don't know who we truly are and we need God to reveal it to us. We belong to another. Our desires, our own longings do not dictate our choices or our path. Our bodies are not our own. Second, the witness of our warfare. We obey when it is hard. We struggle. We fight our own flesh. We put to death what is immoral and impure in us. We do what it takes. We lose the hand or the eye. We do not shrink back from difficulty. We choose obedience even when it's hard. Our obedience is a kind of genuine Christian suffering as Kierkegaard talked about it in his practice in Christianity. A kind of suffering which because of its voluntary nature manages to confound and offend many, including many who would call themselves Christian. We offend and trouble because our lives hold up the truth that Christianity is a costly thing. We remind people of those pesky verses about taking, your taking up your cross and dying yourself and losing your life. We call to mind the figurative verses about how it's better to enter into heaven maimed than not at all, and that it may take painful and extreme measures to live the Christian life, to follow Jesus, that it may not fit neatly into our plans and dreams, that the entering into life that Jesus calls us to is an eternal, infinite goal that relativizes and demotes all of our earthly agendas and projects. Third, the witness of our weakness. My grace is sufficient for you because the power is perfected in weakness. This verse is true. Guys, there's been pain. 
but I have gotten to encounter God in ways that I would not have without him. In places of desperation, he's shown up for me. And yeah, it's been scary and ugly, but as I interact with Christians who haven't been through stuff like this, I'm grateful. You know, you can hear it in our worship, right? I mean, there's nothing like chaste gay Christian worship. <laughs> oh, I mean, I've, we've gotten to see something of him and know something of him precisely through the weakness and the pain and the ache. Fourth, the witness of our worship. In Edith Schaefer's book, Affliction, she suggests that just as the Bible depicts Job's suffering as the locus of confrontation between God and Satan, we can understand all suffering and trial and temptation in our own lives in the same light. We bring God, we bring God glory and we thwart Satan's aims every time we choose him. Satan is at work in every trial, every suffering, hoping to pry us away from faith and hope. And he is confounded and God is glorified every time he fails. As Schaefer says, this is a discovery that can change all of life for us when we begin to realize fully that we can have a part on God's side of the heavenly battle, bringing joy to God and defeat to Satan. There's a passage in the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs, Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, which evokes a similar idea. Now Burroughs is talking about, context Burroughs is talking about content, how contentment is a kind of heaven uh, as it involves rest, joy, praise, and satisfaction in God, which is a pretty standard Puritan motif. But what he goes on to say is what I find really striking. Here's what he says. There, there's a kind of honor that God has, has in our contentment here on earth and an excellence that he does not have in heaven. And it is this, in heaven there's no overcoming of temptations. They are not put to any trials by afflictions. In heaven they have exercise of grace, but they have nothing but encouragement to it. And indeed, the grace of those who are there is perfect. And in that they excel us, but there is nothing to cross their grace. They have no trials at all to tempt them to do contrary. Whereas for a man or woman to be in the midst of afflictions, temptations, and troubles, and yet to have grace exercised, and to be satisfied in God and Christ, and in the word and promises in the midst of all they suffer, this may seem to be an honor that God receives from us that he does not have from the angels and saints in heaven. So I translate this to our own experience. There's a glory that God has in our contentment and faith to follow him in the midst of this, praise him in the midst of this, obey him in the midst of this. I'm sure God prizes the striving for sexual holiness in all of his saints, but it seems to me that he gets a special honor from the predominantly same-sex attracted person who confesses and obeys a biblical sexual ethic that he doesn't get from the happy mar happily married and well-satisfied straight couple. I don't know about you guys, but I sometimes find the absurdity of this all hard to take. It tempts me to doubt. Does it make sense to obey or it doesn't make sense? Was the whole Christianity a thing, a mistake? Did I hit my head sometime in 1998? <laughs> uh, maybe I must be wrong if all these folks on the left and right think I'm screwing things up, that I've got it all wrong. Maybe the world and the theologians of glory are right to think all this weakness and humiliation is stupid but then I take comfort in the absurdity of my Lord Jesus Christ. I as a disciple am not greater than a teach, my teacher. I as a servant am not greater than my master. He confounded everyone. He brought the Pharisees and the Sadducees together in that. <laughs> he was mocked in his suffering. No one understood what he was doing through it. Even his disciples could rarely seem to fathom what he was doing, what he was about. If for a brief moment he got acclaim and favor from the crowds, it was only because of their mistaken assumptions about him and who he was. What everyone perceived as his moment of, what everyone on earth at that time perceived as his moment of greatest failure was actually his moment of ultimate victory and triumph. So when I feel alone in my absurdity with a vast majority of the world that doesn't understand me, at least I know I'm in good company <laughs> with my Lord. 
I'm gonna close with some words from the Puritan Thomas Shepard as he speaks about how Christ's saints, his espoused, look forward to his second coming. This, this is really good, guys, so just, I know it's, it's, it's late, but just, oh my gosh, this is so good. So, okay, so he's, so he's talking about how saints looking forward to the second coming, right? They look that he should take away all shame from them, for no people in the world is laden with more calumnies and reproaches by the wicked and by hypocrites and hard speeches from the godly, and they doubt whether they be sons or no. Now then the whole world shall see that they are sons and shall stand amazed at them and shall not doubt of it, nor themselves, for the Lord shall proclaim it and they shall hear, these are my jewels. Thank you. When, when I wrote my talk for yesterday, I was very deliberately trying to avoid an ugly personal call out situation. Um, when, I mentioned, uh, when I mentioned Rosario and Christopher, I was only doing it to compare, the, if you look in the talk, the only reference to them is to compare how their books are less vulnerable about their present experience of attraction. And that's not any kind of criticism, it's absolutely their prerogative to write any sort of book they want to. And I personally have been edified by much of all of the three books I mentioned. Uh, but it, I was just trying to point out to those who might be wondering uh, that part of the appeal of revoice and spiritual friendship and associated figures is the vulnerability uh, that gives a sense of, oh wow, someone else has felt this too to those of us who read their books. Despite not wanting to get personal, the mere mention of Rosaria's name uh, provoked a reaction of laughter from the audience. Uh, being someone who can't think on her feet, as is obvious, um, <laughs> I didn't know what to say, I just kept going. Um, a lot of people have feelings about this, and a lot of you have graciously uh, communicated your feelings to me, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, we have people here, on the one hand, we have people here who have been blessed by much of her work, and I count myself among them. To be honest, I'm not sure I disagree with her about all that much, except when it comes to how she feels about us, or how she seems to feel about us. Uh, and we also have people here who have been hurt by the posture she has taken toward us and the ways in which she has engaged or not engaged us and the ripple effects that that has had in our local churches. And I count myself among them too. A bunch of people sensed a vibe of tribalism in that moment that made them wonder whether they belong here. And that hurts because we all know how hard it is to find a space where we feel we belong. I personally have been discouraged by the, I believe, unnecessary divisions that have arisen among this small remnant of those of us who are trying to follow God faithfully in this. I mean, this isn't about, you know, for years I've been feeling this way. Um, so my hope and prayer is that we would extend charity and grace and love toward one another in, here in this room and also to the, toward those outside of it, even when it's hard, and that somehow we would humbly, graciously, and prayerfully seek a spirit of unity appropriate to our relationship as siblings in Christ. Thanks. Thank